Hello, everyone. And hello, Alessa Salmon. Greetings from Chiang Mai. Welcome to our public program for the exhibition series, Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories. I'm Kritiya Gavivong Ojiap, a curator at the Jim Thompson Art Center and a guest curator for, of my EM Contemporary Art Museum. So this exhibition is a dialogue between the collections of Gary National Indonesia, Jakarta, and uh, my EM Contemporary Art Museum in Chiang Mai, National Gallery, Stadlik Museum, Subalin, and Singapore Art Museum, Singapore, initiated by the Goethe Institute and conceived since 2017, which is five years ago. Uh, the subtitle, Collecting Entanglements and Embodied Histories, aims to, I quote, trace stories, culture histories, and absent histories, whose spirit populate the present and seek new narrative and ex in explores interwoven histories within nation building processes, individual identity formation, and the reflections of the embodiments in the artistic works and the exhibition histories. So the, I would like to introduce my colleagues, you know, who we've been working together since five years, as I previously always stress, uh, Katharina from Hamburger Bahnhof, and Grace, you know, for uh, National Gallery, and June Yap, you know, from Singapore Art Museum. Okay, so this event, uh, body is not just the fresh response to one of the exhibition uh, title Erata that I am curating for my EM Contemporary Art Museum Chiang Mai, which opens tomorrow, thirtieth of July, until the first of November, and uh, because of the the whole ideas of tracing alternate alternate histories from our collection as well as exhibition histories. So this exhibition, Arata, attempts to problematize the complexity of small narrative artistic practice, such as through performance art, media-based works, and multidisciplinary works from marginal, marginalized voices, particular women who use their body and cameras to enca encapsulate and embody the entangled histories. I, uh, the questions that I, I trying to raise, you know, within the show is like, how do contemporary artists work as archaeologists to excavate untold history, and how they, how are they revisiting, re revisiting the collective memory and proposing the rewritten versions? Okay, so in this exhibition, I kind of, uh, you know, we split the the, the 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 exhibitions in different different sections and different chapters. And one is called Reclaiming the Body, Women and Performance Art. And it's about the alt alternate history from women's perspective. Responds to the name of the museum that honors Zhao Zhong Yan, the great aunt of uh, Eric Booth, the co-founders of the museum. So however, the interest is not about the dichotomy of men and women, but it's rather shift uh, the focus in the way of seeing things and the world and situate the position of women in art history within the region and beyond, especially in the context of global social movement from the Cold War onwards. So this movement focused on human rights and equality among many groups of the voiceless women call out for their rights and their presence in the public spheres. This section show how many women artists from Southeast Asia and Germany use and reclaim their bodies as the self-representation, explore the identity politics and critiquing the institutions from different contexts. So I would like to introduce Zoe Bart, my esteemed colleague who supposed to be here. <laughs> Where is Zoe? Hi, Zoe. Uh, Zoe is uh, my esteemed colleague who share the vis these visions and has similar concern about thinking and practicing a curatorial project in Southeast Asian region. And is trying to expand the network to other parts of the world, especially the global South. Zoe has started her curatorial career at the APT Brisbane. And she moved upward you know, to East Asia from Beijing and then down to Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> so, um, uh, following Long March and Ho Chi Minh Trail, okay, uh, she's been working with uh, Sans Art, you know, along with uh, Din Kule, Tiffany Chung, and Tuan, Andrew Nguyen, you know, who's also has worked in this exhibition. 
and always interested in building the institution, infrastructures, and community. Zoe is working as a director of the Factory uh, Contemporary Arts Center in Ho Chi Minh City. And her recent project that we really enjoyed was the Charge of Biennale in 2019. So I want to thank Zoe, who's now in the full lockdown from her apartment in Ho Chi Minh City for agreeing to moderate this session. And uh, let me go through tonight's program. First, Zoe will introduce the three speakers, you know, uh, Sutirat, Kavita, and Arayamani, and moderate this, this conversation. After that, you know, my curator team will join Katharina, Grace, and June to discuss and or comments or even ask more questions. So for the audience, uh, feel free to click like and share this broadcast. And if you have questions, please send them to us via YouTube channel or Facebook. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Zoe Bart and the three speakers. The screen is yours, Zoe. Thank you, Jill. And a big thank you to Goethe. And it's so nice to be in a Zoom room with so many amazing colleagues that I miss so much. I have really struggled this last 18 months of being uh, unable to move. So I, I think that it is worth pointing out that if we're going to discuss that the body is not just flesh, we really do need to understand that the people who are speaking with me today and in the room are in some quite horribly compromised situations due to the current COVID pandemic. So I really send my heart out to all who are stuck like me. And I do hope that this brief two hours or so can provide a slight reprieve of the larger world out there that we do all still very much care about. And I mean, if there's anything I am quite alarmed by with COVID is that it seems to have subsumed so many of many other urgent issues that are still ongoing. And we must remember that we can't forget in as much as the COVID-19 situation is absolutely horrifyingly present and real. But let's focus on a little bit of positivism to begin. So as Jeb says, if you have any questions, do go to the chat function on YouTube or Facebook. It will be collected by the behind the scenes staff who will funnel it through to, to me and I can then pose the questions uh, accordingly. So how this is going to work is I'm going to give a very brief introduction to each artist, share a little bit of the work that's in the Irata exhibition. And then I thought it would be really quite interesting to get each of these artists to share their personal experiences behind what motivates the key subject matters within their work. I always find as a curator that personal experiences often mar and continue to motivate the passions behind the making. And artists often don't get a chance to really share the details. So hopefully there's a little time today to hear from them on this uh, issue. So I wanted to share a little bit of my own relationship to what the body meant for me in a, learning about Southeast Asian contemporary art, which as uh, Jeb mentioned, I started out with the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art in Brisbane, Australia, which at the time the museum was called the Queensland Art Gallery. It's now called the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art. Indeed, it's where I first heard and saw the work of Aramayani. So, one of the things that really struck me as, as a young curator was that in the early 1990s, the body was an incredibly political body. It was by many artists across Southeast Asia used by those who were trained in painting and printmaking. They resorted to their own bodies because they were frustrated within the systems of what painting or printmaking could be. And that was largely coming from an education from a colonial imprimatur, various structures of colonization, setting up certain generalized ideas about what art could be, 
teaching it. And then these contemporary artists are aware that their cultural traditions often have much more to give in terms of the materiality of, a, of what was available to speak. And it really struck me that the body was a place where many felt it was the only place to be able to speak about contextual issues related to what it meant to be nation struggling to form some kind of peaceful negotiation of freedom at the time. It became clear that the body was a dispensable kind of object. It was almost like there was a frustration with thinking the body was something we could easily throw away and mark. And this was largely coming from the voices of men at the time. And that was a really, really strong question for me was why are all of these bodies appearing in Southeast Asian art mainly from men? Women were the wives, the collaborators, but very few were the actual authors. Over the last 20 to near 30 years, we've seen some dramatic change to that. And today we get to hear from three really incredible artists who are really deftly moving this conversation of the body into new directions that I think quite strongly reflect the 21st century global concerns that we all have, which peel away from a focus on whether we are male or female, but instead to really ask ourselves as humans, how do we engage the various issues of the body? And I was recently at a lunch with a, a diplomatic service on the occasion of Women's Day in Vietnam. And I had some 20 CEOs, female from very prominent Vietnamese companies. And we were all asked to share the contributions that we felt we'd made to our careers as women. And I was quite struck that the 20 powerful CEOs at this table with me were marking the fact that they had secured breastfeeding rooms. They'd managed to secure a maternity leave program there was now a kindergarten for after school care. Not one of them mentioned their abilities or their achievements intellectually in having contributed to the very businesses that were paying the salary. Our bodies are not just flesh. I came away saying to myself, women today have so much more empowered space to be able to speak and I'm really, Today, we will hear about three artists who really take their practices in serious ways that commit to cause. And they bring up topics that aren't just about our biological processes as women, because they speak much more broadly about issues to do with our psychologies, living in an industrialized economy, dealing with so many different fractures of faith and how these cultural transgressions and prejudices affect our ability to connect and understand the need to be diverse in our thinking. And then to also broadly more better understand climate change and our environment as a body to which we also daily inhabit. So we're going to unpack some of these issues today and I want to begin with the work of Kawita Bhattanajanka. I hope I said your last name right. So if we could um, begin to play the spinning wheel. Thank you. So this is the, the work that is inside the Irata exhibition. And Kawita, we see her body forming this kind of spinning wheel where we see thread being pulled from her body and then it's moving to the other side. And it's this constant rotation that moves in one direction and then in the other. This is part of a broader series for her called Performing Textiles, which I believe was commissioned by the Dunedin Public Art Gallery in New Zealand. And it quite brilliantly shows how Kawita's broader practice really questions, what does it mean for our body? to be considered the tool that is producing? What does it mean if we start to think of the body as the object that is being purchased? And this is a, a recurring kind of gesture in most of her performance works. She works mainly with video. 
And she's often engaging highly problematic endurance stressed situations where her body is being tested very, very, at times what I think to be quite violently. In this particular body of work, we see high saturated lollipop colours behind her body where she's being with her head dipped in, in, in ink and she's being used as a mop. Here she's a spinning wheel. In others, she's a knitting yarn. And this was all at the time responding to New Zealand being a mass trade source for wool. And she's looking further at how in her home country of Thailand, most of the textile industries are mass factories, mostly with women as the laborers. And for her, this was a, a really prominent issue to think about how do we actually exploit or as consumers, how do we know we are contributing to this level of exploitation? What are the conditions through which these workers have to continue to be subjected to? And, and, and for me, I, I couldn't help after seeing her work and only sadly, I'm not seeing it physically, I've only seen it through documentation, but you can't help but ask yourself, how am I contributing to the continuing levels of exploitation that we see, particularly of, of feminine stereotypes of the feminine body. So right now, what I would like to do is I'd like to invite Kawita to share a little bit about um, her background because she comes from quite a, uh, a unique um, educational background in Thailand. And then she's going to share a particular performance as part of uh, this project, which will share with you some of the psychological issues that she has to unpack in the experiences of her performances. Thanks, Kawita. Hello, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Kawita. And yes, I am a video and performance artist from Bangkok, Thailand. Um, just to give you a little bit of more background of performing textile. So after coming from New Zealand and research in Thailand, performing textiles and the research about um, the exploitations within the fast fashion industries takes me to many, many places around the world for research journeys, uh, field trips, uh, field studies, and to interview all the laborers and especially female laborers um, uh, in India, um, in Cambodia, for example. So um, what I find, what I found is the fact that this is such a global issue which affects most female laborers within the um, developing countries, especially in Asia. And so with fast fashion comes with, with mass production of higher demands and high supplies, which profits the brand owners, the brands, because of the, because they want us all to purchase fast every season. But the profits for the brand and the benefits for the brands does not profit the people behind the scenes, which are the female workers, the laborers who are working repetitively every second of every day to produce such high supplies. Um, instead, they are being paid very, very low with very low wages that does not add up to their living cost. It's low until that they feel that they can't really survive anymore. So there's this journey that I that I went to in India. So I, I spent about one month in India for research interviews and field trips um, to uh, interview these garment workers as well as look into the cotton farming, which is about um, the exploitations of the fast fashion industry. So when I went there, um, slightly before that, a little bit, there was this protest of these female laborers who are protesting and they were holding up these signs and, and, and they said, um, are, we, are we machines? So they feel that they're being dehumanized. They feel that they're being treated as, as non-human, as non-living. And um, as I looked further, so there was this protests in Bangladesh and in Cambodia. So many, many places. And 
it, for example, in the True Cost uh, documentary, um, I saw that the garment workers, the female garment workers who came out to protest in Cambodia, they were holding up signs because they would like to have more wages for their living costs. And they are being treated quite violently behind the scene with harsh treatment. And the result for that protest was the fact that they're being shot, being stopped, being muted and, and silenced. And there were a num numbers of, of death during that protest. And, and by seeing that, I, I was very, very quite upset and, and angry. And I feel very responsible as, as a consumer. And I feel that, you know, every, every person as consumers should feel very responsible because I felt that I was a part of the problem. I felt as as consumers, I was as a consumer, I was a part of this broken system of of capitalism, which which makes me spending all of my money, but the money always go up to the people on the top of the pyramid, the brand owners, the dress, the the big industries. Um, people who are who are the wealth but the money never comes down to the people on the bottom of the pyramid which are the laborers who are suffering <laughs> to survive every second of every day and so i felt you know as as an artist what what can i do to to help and to raise the voice and to raise this this voice that was silenced, that were forever silenced by the officers, by the governments. How could I do that? And uh, just to give you my background, I came from a background where I was living in such a bubble. I, I was I I was born in quite a, a I have to accept a quite a privileged family where I was kind of blocked. Uh, by all these knowledge and information, and 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 my, and my world was 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 quite pleasant for me, and so by knowing and by understanding uh, all of these through research and documentary, I felt that yes, I was definitely blocked, and I was definitely living in this bubble, but how could I gain this understanding? How could I do that? if I'm still living in this, in this bubble. So I have to get out of this bubble, not only by interviewing, because that would give me a sense of understanding. I know that I would not be able to claim myself that you know I understand I, or I feel totally what it means to be objectified, what it means to be dehumanized, but at least I would like to taste what it means the understanding of what it means to be objectified. So remember what I said that there was this sign that, that we're holding up and it says, are we machines? So I felt like, yes, what if I objectify myself, putting my body into machines, body as machines. So I'm just gonna share my screen a little bit and for, um, so that you would see. Okay. So in performing textiles series, I would put myself into various um, textile machines or textile tools um, to put my body and to taste that glimpse of being objectified. For example, this is dye where act as the dyeing machine, my face are being drowned within this red dye. Um, my hair was replaced by this cotton yarns and being dipped into the dye, the chemical red dye for about almost eight minutes. This is the spinning wheel in which you've seen already. This is um, carding machine where I was cutting um, the tangled yarns. And this is where I act as the shuttle within the weaving machine, but this is the human weaving machine.
So how do I do that? How do I taste a glimpse of the understanding of what it means to be objectified? First, I would have to um, enter the performance. So every time that I enter the performance, I would enter it as myself, as a human being, as a human body. But then I would have to test myself in order to become a complete machine by putting myself in quite a very uncomfortable, very difficult, very violent situation sometimes so that my body and mind is crushed. When my body and mind is crushed, it has this sense of, of powerlessness, it's very weak. How is it crushed? Like, you know, when you, when you confront something quite violently, at first you feel the pain, right? But as time goes by, your sensory, your, your nervous system and your mind starts to go numb. And that's the, the powerlessness and the weakness that I get, it's numb. And at the time that is numb and powerless, the mind reached to a state of, of nothingness. So the mind lost its sense of, of being, lost its sense of self, lost the sense of identity because it's, it's numb. Like I, it can't really feel any emotions anymore. And then the body turns itself to be only a coverage, an envelope, but inside is, is, is empty. And then at that moment, the body turns into something of a non-living object. So that's the process of the transition of the body from a human being to be objectified into a non-living by the stages of, of the performance. Um, I'm going to give you uh, an example of um, one work which is called Knit. Um, when I perform with videos, I know the timeline. I've practiced for three to four weeks until I get the, the right timeline in order to perform. But there was this one time where um, I, I created a work called Knit, which was first exhibited in Bangkok at, during the Bangkok Biennale. But then this work took me to a lot of places and exhibitions and live performance around the world. And this work is called Knit. Okay. Does everybody seeing my screen? Okay. So before playing knit, so this work where I act as the knitting machine. So during my research in Bangkok um, knitting factory, um, talking to the laborers, I encountered this knitting machine. It's a circular knitting machine with a needle in the middle of the machine. And this needle sort of goes around to knit quite quickly, very, very quickly to knit the circular red, the circular fabric. And I was thinking, okay, in order to act as the machine, I should act as this needle that uses all parts of my body. So my legs, my mouth, my two of my hands. So, so every part of my body is turned into this knitting needle that is knitting the, the circular fabric. Um, this performance is originally um, performed for one hour, but there's this particular personal experience um, which happens in Abu Dhabi that the performance was limited to only about 20 minutes <laughs> that I had to finish this, this, this fabric. So what you're looking at is an, a one hour performance, but imagine this performance, but three times faster with a huge clock that is sitting right next to my performance stage, which, which was 
quite strange. But um, as a result, I had to sort of like every time that I perform, I had to look at the clock and come back and perform again, look at the clock. Oh, this is time. Is this time? Is this time? It results in so much pain because I had to finish. I had to um, I, because I was using a lot of my mouth movements, for example, here where I use my legs, my mouth to bite the fabric, uh, to bite the yarns in order to knit the fabric. I had to finish in 20 minutes. So that results in, I didn't realize until I finished the, the whole performance because when I was acting as the machine, I was I was quite numb. I, I couldn't feel any emotions. I, I didn't know how it felt, but during the end of the performance, my two sides of my mouth were resulting in bleeding and my um, my neck, my neck, my um, my neck was strangled with the yarns. My eyes were kind of like being covered with the knotted yarn so I could not see properly. So that was a very, very <laughs> difficult situation that I had to be in. Just gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so everyone's seeing me now. Okay. So because of that moment that I realized that, okay, I was like being strangled by this not, not yarns. I was blinded. I couldn't see properly, but I still had to keep working because I had to rush until the performance is finished in, in on time because I had only 20 minutes to finish it. And I was in so much pain during the end of the performance. And I think that that was the moment when I finished and I got up and I thought that, okay, I'm in such a mess. I had bruises everywhere. I had cuts from the yarns. My mouth was bleeding. And actually I could not eat any food except drinks <laughs> for the next week or so um, when I was staying in Abu Dhabi. So I think that that gave me the closer glimpse of what it means to, to, to be objectified, what it means to be a machine because I was living within this machinery pace during that performance. So that was that was the personal experience that I that I felt um, of that performance. So I think that by being objectified, by being dehumanized, I think I I, I wish for for my work to to share with the audience. So not only in in museums or I, I feel like I want this work to be or 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 all of my works to be viewed um, also outside of the, the art world, any audience should feel that they're responsible for this, as I said, this broken system of capitalism, of purchasing, of spending, but the money always goes up to the top of the pyramid. Yeah, and Kawita, I think it's, um, it's quite interesting that this performance was actually staged at Peninsula Hotel, no? Yes, it was. It was. It was the at the Bangkok Art Biennale, where, where, actually, that was the first performance that that I that I created, and so my venue was the Peninsula Hotel, and at the um, Asia Cheek Building. So that was my sort of um, the venue that was you know chosen for for me, but the fact that I feel that even, even now, I feel that any, any exhibitions, any performance, any live performance that I'm, that I'm doing, it's, it's about the conversation with any type of audience that I want to speak to and, and for them to be able to see a body, a female body, a human being, turned into 
a machinery um, mm. uh, with, well, we with so much pain. Um, I think hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end. We we should move on to Aramayani for now, but thank you so much for for sharing the, I myself was quite impacted by reading um, our emails exchanging over the last uh, months and, and the amount of psychological and physical repercussions you go through as a consequence of staging your work. And I hope to hear more about the audience responses when we get to the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now to, to speak on Aramayani, I mean, it's a pleasure to be in the room with you. I have to say that uh, your work was very uh, impressionable to my young mind when I first started reading about it. And it was, for me, the introduction to Indonesian culture in a way, because I was in Australia at the time, I'd never been to Indonesia. And it was the first woman's voice to speak from a real sense of personal attachment because you are a Muslim woman who is also a Hindu um, Buddhist background. So you have this incredible ancestry within you and yet you live in a community and in a country that has largely, dare I say, underestimated its cultural deep memory when it comes to the Hindu Buddhist traditions and being predominantly, at least I think it's a 90% Islamic country now, much of your practice has sought to really try to give presence to difference and to understanding how that presence is spoken for not only as a woman, but as someone who is situated within particular contexts and be that whether it's a spiritual context, whether it's in the Tibetan plateaus, because I know you've been doing quite a lot of work with uh, those particular communities. But then I know um, in the Irata exhibition, if we can share the, the video, please. I'm just going to let him hear the sound. One of the things that really, um, you can play the video, but just leave the sound off. Thank you. Aramayani is one of the most pioneering figures for performance art, not only within Indonesia, but dare I say, across most of Southeast Asia. One of the challenges that she really speaks to is how our cultural traditions possess mythical narratives that really are still relevant today about how much we assume of certain stereotypes, social stereotypes, gender stereotypes. In this particular work in Irata, I don't want to be a part of your legend. It's a tale told from the Ramayana and it's so focusing on Sita and she's been abducted by the demon King Rowana and she's returned and her husband, King Rama and the court officials, they don't quite know whether they trust that she's, that of, she, they're doubtful of her chastity. And so she must undergo a test of walking through fire to, to prove her purity. So the, the goddess Sita represents dedication, self-sacrifice, courage and purity. And these are uh, symbols within this work and and Yanni is, is in here saying, dare I say that I don't want to be a part of your particular rituals that say that I have to undergo these tests to prove who I am. And this goes to the heart of Ramayani's practice where it's, it's speaking about what does it mean to have a body, to identify that this is a body that I have the control over. 
Much of her work looks at issues of authority and how fear feeds into how we are controlled or how we assume we're blindly knowing that we are being controlled. So one of the things um, which I hope we can speak a bit uh, later on is I'm also quite fascinated with some of the recent work that Aramiani has been doing with communities in, in Tibet in line with thinking of how our mythical narratives, our bodies are actually also responsible for caring for our environmental landscapes. But Yanni, if you uh, could share a little bit about your own identifications of the body within this piece, and I know you have a particular personal experience to share of, of, of a dilemma that you went through, which was quite influential on your practice. Okay, thank you, Zoe. And yeah, thank you for everyone um, to invite me uh, on this show. And uh, now I can talk a little bit about uh, the work. Yeah, this is uh, a video kind of uh, art but actually it's based on performance because actually I, I was holding the, the puppet. Uh, but this is also a special puppet, not just like a um, usual traditional one. Um, I created out of this uh, dry leaf and it has a symbolic meaning related to the um, female body, yeah? how it is um, vulnerable, you know? But besides that um, weakness, I also believe it has its own strength. That's why I use this symbol of dry leaves. So, you know, dry leaves, when it is falling down on earth, is becoming a kind of a good fertilizer for the soil, right? Uh, but this is, the reality is like, not really uh, obvious. People has to have some knowledge to understand this, right? Okay, so uh, this work is based, of course, on my um, critic on um, basically patriarchal system. But then when it comes to the female body, as also Kavita explained about her work, you know, this is not only being manipulated or seen as object only just by male, but also by the system itself, say capitalism industry system, yeah? Um, and then, yeah, you know what happened? with this uh, kind of operation of this kind of system, besides uh, exploiting um, human resources, right? But also uh, the natural resources too, that impacted in the destruction of environment, but also of these bodies of this people, including women, were being exploited as well, right? Yeah, so, all right. But, okay, I refer to this ancient culture from Hindu period and also Buddhist period and also actually animist period too, because I understood that uh, my uh, background is very mixed and um, the history of culture from uh, this area, actually not only Indonesia, but Southeast Asia, basically, is actually uh, very uh, multicultural. And I see it as something positive. Yeah? Although I'm supposed to be a Muslim, but I can appreciate also what is good and what is interesting from other culture. Okay, so with this Ramayana story, um, although, yeah, I'm also questioning about how this, the woman is being positioned, you know, Sita, in this story. But okay, this is maybe one of the interpretation because uh, when I learn more and more, there are versions of, you know, stories from the past, yeah? 
But now people in this modern time has a kind of limited access, you know, from this uh, cultural, for this cultural heritage, especially in, in country like Indonesia. You know why? Because of this impact of colonialization. Yeah. Uh, I give you an example. The British, the uh, Dutch, they looted, you know, artifacts, cultural artifacts, and also manuscripts. Yeah. Uh, the Dutch actually doing worse thing than the British. Uh, and I have been working on this kind of issue uh, with some Dutch uh, museums because uh, the Dutch uh, king now is promising to return the artifacts and the manuscript. But you know what is still there, for example, the a uh, number of the artifact, artifacts that is still in Holland today is more than 10,000, including artifacts made out of gold, you name it, diamond, you know, very expensive anyway, but also it's very antique, right? And in manuscript, there are still 100,000, and this is the knowledge from the past. You know, that's why. Since I was young, I'm trying to dig up, you know, what is this heritage, missing heritage, you know, because there are some valuable and interesting and valuable kind of, you know, um, values there, right? Yeah, okay. Although, of course, there is also something that I need to criticize when it is being represented in a new kind of way or a new interpretation. And it does and you have those a direct relate. experience with that too, don't you? Yeah, sure. So yeah, do share your story of exhibiting that, that material. Okay, so, and then because of this limited knowledge, yeah, of mm. the heritage from the past, and when I try to bring it up and reinterpret it, you know, I'm not just like bringing it up like an exotic and uh, romanticizing the, the past, right? Exotic stuff. No, no, I don't do that. But I reinterpret it and put it within the today's context, okay? And okay, then I did this work where I reinterpreted the symbol of Linga and Yoni. Uh, maybe uh, you can see also the image of this uh, work. And this is very ancient kind of uh, heritage. You find it in Hinduism, but also in Buddhism, actually this principle, and also in animism. Or in China, it's called yin yang, you know. Uh, and in the Middle East, ancient Middle East, it's becoming cross. It's a symbol of balance of uh, oppositional, you know, power or energy on nature. Yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, you can help me showing the image. And this work has been misunderstood by the hardliners Islamists. One of the reasons is because they are, they are Indonesian, they are not coming from Middle East. But they lost their kind of knowledge about the cultural past, about the history about the roots of their own culture, okay? And then, because of this, uh, I exhibited this work in 1994 in Jakarta, and um, I got death threat. They say that they will be allowed to drink my blood. Can you believe it? Mm. Yeah, it's so crazy, right? And I said, hey, guys, I'm also a Muslim. And I never been taught, you know, or learned about the, the principle of teaching of Islamic language that you allow to drink anybody's blood. Even you are not allowed to drink alcohol, you know, how can you <laughs> allow to drink blood? <laughs> how crazy, right? But anyway, mm -hmm. they keep insisting because, yeah, you know, this uh, hardliners movement is a political kind of movement and this is not just you know, pure 
like uh, fighting for Islam, but this complex, this also related to the global economic system too. You know, how these politicians and this so-called hardliners activists, you know, they are actually cooperating, mm. you know? So this is also one of the strategy to make the people fight with each other, kill each other even, you know, this is the so-called, um, what is it, uh, strategy to make people or group fight with each other, yeah? Mm. And besides that, this is also a strange strategy to divert it, you know, attention from people. People is becoming busy with this, oh, religion is so important, you know, while they're doing something else, you know, like they are doing mining, they are, you know, uh, the foresting, the, our forest, right? And people are busy with these religious things. This mm. is really tricky, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I think this question of repatriation and, and knowing that there are so many cultural objects that are not in the context that have originally produced, mm -hmm. ritualized, uh, that they've been so far away from these communities for so long and then returning them to the context of Indonesia today, it's really quite troubling. It's quite sad to see how these symbols are no longer registered for the true meanings that they were brought into the world and that they are heavily skinned with all of this, this prejudice and ultimately fear, yeah? It's fear. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you, Yanni. I hope that we have some time for questions. I'm sure there will be, I hope there will be a lot at the end, but thank you so much for sharing. We now yeah. need to um, move on to um, Sutirat Suprinya, or otherwise known as SOM. And, um, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing some the, the, the most out of these three, these three ladies. And I've always, I have to say some that when I watched a separation of sand and islands, which is, can we show the work please? Thank you. Um, I was re-watching this the other day and I have to say it really made my day. I, after being in lockdown for as long as I have to be able to be transported to a landscape such as this northern Lao Thai region and to see how you continue to be this intrepid traveler going along incredible river bodies within Thailand and you always have this way of your camera encapsulating such poetry. I always think you have a, a knack for bringing this world that is so far away from our urban context and you give history presence with the way that you will document what's going on today. And most of the time I find you are looking at comparisons of trade and monopoly of river systems that have occurred or landscapes more broadly in Thailand and its neighboring natural boundaries that it has with countries like Cambodia or, or Laos. And I recognize that much of your research involves um, looking at how there's been very uh, traditional forms of dikes to uh, hinder or, or prevent uh, or flow of water in these river systems. You will study these traditional systems. Um, you've also gone so far as to look at colonial histories and what resources and books were used to chart the Mekong and you will use these as reference points for your own journeys through these, these landscapes. And I know that in discussing uh, this particular talk today, this idea of the body is for you much more about the landscape as a body and that you're charting the damage that the human race has done. Indeed, you're often also quite drawn to how different cultures have learned to, to live the seasonal changes that are present within much of this biodiversity, which is under threat because of these massive damming projects that is occurring across the entire body of the Mekong. Um, so I, I know that you have a particular 
again, personal stories to share about your own motivations to working with these particular bodies of, of water. And yeah, please do share. Thank you so much, Soyi. Um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to share my experience uh, here. And thanks. thank you so much to invite me here. Um, let me introduce my practice by starting with uh, some selection of my previous works that so invite me to give a perspective on a typographical body. Um, I will start with the time I questioned in the violence and untold story in the main media is because it turned myself to seriously learn Thai politics and start to read and hear history and what it has been distorted brainwash it in media and educational system. So the work I want to share today, the first one is an, a non-video works. So I will share screen. Did I share? Yep. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, this work installed at seven dark corners of Chiang Mai city as a metaphor of the invisible area. Uh, it's called White Shadows. It's about seven figures of prisoners of conscience who accused and prosecuted on charge of uh, Le Majesty Article 112 in Thailand. This article and its use posted a serious threat to the right of, free, uh, of freedom of expression. And, but Unfortunately, this personal became invisible in the main media and in public. And this work want to briefly um, make them visible. I create the figure made by white reflective sheets on a wall in the dark public area. Uh, it made the figures become visible when the car or motorbike drive past the area at night because the light would, sh would shine to it. And then the reflective figure will would reflecting back to your eyes. Um, like the situation of the prisoner that the appearance of the, uh, of the work during the, the day is almost invisible because it's white color and it's put on the white wall. But the light at night make it uh, briefly visible. Um, so the next works I want to show also because it's, uh, I have something to say about uh, the story behind. This work is quite you no know, expression to a massacre of the red, red shirt or pro-democracy group when they occupied the center of financial area in Bangkok in 2010. It was the time I supposed to travel to Bangkok and then to Korat to stay at Tim Thompson farm. But because my schedule, but because of the, the event, my schedule kept postponed. Uh, there are a lot of violence in Bangkok in April and May. And many protesters travel from every part of Thailand to join this uh, demonstration. But how they get there with no money? The answer is by train. Um, because at that time, the, the third class train is free of charge for Thai citizens. Um, because uh, the government helped people to observe the price of food, which was extremely high at the time. Um, they protest in the day and sleep on the street at night. For many nights, those who slept there were killed by an unidentified black suit man, keep themselves on, the, on high buildings and use the laser gun to fire the head and then shot them. But they still keep staying. Every night I slept, I thought how brave they are to sleep on that street where they can get shot at any time, right? When I can travel again to Bangkok, uh, it's, I was still frightening about the event. But however, I took a train at the same way as them. I took the overnight train, shot this video from its window. But 
when you look at the work alone, you, even it's very simple scene, uh, one wouldn't know what it is uh, because I, I, because of the image and the sound is 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 only partly of what you uh, assume, um, and that's why I want to demonstrate here how easily to manipulate media, uh, audio and visual, and to do this I respond with how the media was controlled and lie us during the massacre uh, event. Uh, when prime minister at that time say is what nothing happened and it was a peaceful management. Uh, the works visually show something related to shooting gun event, but presented it as a shooting star scenes. Um, but actually it's not shooting stars, <laughs> just the name of the, the works. Is uh, the contemplation of the event and place through this work by demonstrated the travel on the same route transportation and transportation in the night scene. Next, um, then, uh, uh, this this work is uh, the name, the title of the work. In, below uh, this, uh, also as a body of memory and history. Um, the river scape reflect the past of my grandpa life and also other people in his generation who traveled through this route and also what happened to those who suffer from the flood and when the dam started to collect uh, a large amount of water, uh, then there the is, uh, is uh, is uh, hurt the people who live in, in that area because it it's became a big flood and a, a big, um, a big um, um, the the river become uh, not not only a small river but it become a, a big lake. Um, lastly, it reflect the body of the life of the river also um, that has been shaped by human activities. Um, to follow my grandpa route is to follow his dimension of experience he might has. It's also the way to understand the past to the current situation by those who still live, who still alive and live in that area. And so the landscape in this world is the is the body where I would like to be at, uh, at to be an in person witness in order to create a conversation, inspection, uh, and contempt contemplate about the subject. Um, many of my works come from reading and being at the locations. In some projects, I went back and forth uh, between reading and traveling, especially uh, uh, the, the work that heavily a lot about history. Um, so I traveling to the place sometime more than one time and, and because I want to confirm the knowledge that I got and then to get a so solid idea for the works in detail. Um, and other works, uh, after that uh, river works, I, I also interested because th that river is uh, the, the effect, the, the impact of the river uh, in the that works, um, um, it's happened because of the big dam. Uh, uh, made by the electricity generation. So I interested in that topic. And so I, I created another work It's called when, Needs, when Need Moves the Earth. Uh, it is a memory and curiosity of when I was a young kid, uh, about eight, eight years old, on the body of landscape and architecture at electricity generation. Um, this is my <laughs> image of my visit when I was about eight or nine years old. I visited my uncle who worked there and it left me a curiosity about this place and how it works. Uh, it hit me hard in my memory when I first arrived there at night after I sleep it uh, dark night trip, as you can see how, how dark of the landscape at night and through the shooting star, the works. I arrived there and at the uh, 
electricity generation seeing a large land that filled with a lot of light look like a constellation of star. Uh, it was stunning and to to wake up and see to, to wake up and see this and be, and that's why it's keep kept this in my memory. And with this memory, I have a chance to propose uh, this project with the Earth Observatory of Singapore at Nanyang University. Then I have an excuse to discover the place again. Um, and this time I can ask many questions that I want to Tom, I don't know if your sound has dropped out or maybe you were. <laughs> oh, okay, you're back. Sorry. Are you working fast? <laughs> no, I'm just wondering if you're if you're still going or you're finished. I have one more. Uh, okay. So uh, just a sample that how I um um my how the work go through the electricity generation operation. So my, I want to talk the last work about my current works. It's not finished yet. It's called Collapsing Crowds from Stars, which I visited 24 plus places of resistance in Thailand. It's uh, motivated from a long journey moving to, Tha to Thais uh, who fight for their democracy, freedom of expression, and identity in the history until now. Um, so I, I visited the place to witness to such places. Um, it's a highly important for me because I would feel uh, sensitivity, sadness, brave, respect, all kinds of sentiment that may echo when I'm standing at each place. Uh, for at least, and an, I stay at the place for an hour um, to shooting that. It looked like uh, to make a pilgrimage to a place which hold the spirit of someone who built the early step of resistance before us. Um, but after reading books and hearing story of each event in the past, uh, to walk and stand at the exact place to confirm me it really is. Uh, uh, to me, this way of landscape in person is allow me to investigate uh, in many dimensions, which uh, the remote introduction by reading book can can tell. Um, to end this, to end this presentation, I want to show this image, and um, I want to read a very quick, uh, only some part of the poem um, that is as example of how the language that I, I read, read uh, respond with the location of someone who disappear. Um, it's a poem called Hikayat by Sakaria Omaza uh, on um, Haji Sulong, who, who is a sp spiritual leader from the Deep South who disappeared in Songkra City um, in 67 years ago. Um, the poem goes like this. It must have been the stream of the beast that swallow him alive without a tracks, without any news. Some said he lived in stories. Many would want him to live in Hikayat. Nobody recalls his name, only official record do. Some would remember him as the drow seven desserts. Nobody remember him since he become a mountain, a river, a land stretching to the edge of the Malayu Peninsula. Thank you. <laughs> this end. Thank you, Sam. And it's a really wonderful way to 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 end a, a discussion from three highly attuned minds to the politicization of aesthetics. You are all incredibly aware of how each of your work speaks to a political imagination. And I think that that is one of the wonders for me of working with artists is that I'm reminded that our political imaginations matter and that they can have different forms, whether it be appreciation of our natural environment, whether it be understanding the cultural largesse of our historical objects and the fact that their meanings are constantly present and changing, but still valid. 
And then also for thinking about how our gestures and our bodies and it's mechanized, our seemingly mechanized habits need to be assessed for how it feeds into larger conversations about capital, about industrialized ideas of the body and, and how we assume our sense of self inside, our usage of our smartphones, easy access to water, agricultural developments, whether they be uh, you know, heritage in, impinged or politically motivated. I mean, all of this is, is what each of you are in some form or another challenging. And it's, I've really appreciated being amongst it uh, for the last uh, month or so preparing a little bit for today. But we are now open for some questions from the audience. So I, I have one already uh, coming from Indonesia by uh, it's coming from uh, Rianto Otner, who says, can we accept another way of looking at gender as unregulated, but more fluid and alive? What do you think if we humans only know the body? Does anyone want to reply? I, I think, I think, Yes, uh, yeah, please, Ramani. It's pretty some first cut, then I then I'll, I'll follow. I think I think we can skip to mention about gender. Yes, but except if it's related, uh, if it's only related to uh, by by biological things that uh, we need to know for health reason or you know something like that, then uh, you need to mention. I think if it's not related to to that, I think we can skip. Um, I, I, I would like to answer a little bit um, from that question. Um, yes, I, I think that it is, it is quite ideal, isn't it, to, to view a body as, to view body as not a cons biological constructed so that we're not so that mm -hmm. us as, as genders are not constrained by this belief um, so that mm -hmm. me as 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 um, me as as a woman would have more opportunities to um, opportunities that would be more open for me as a gender as a woman if I'm not constrained and constructed by my biology and I feel I've, um, I've read um, the book about um, what if we change? What if we don't have the body? What if the body does, does not matter? Because we're constructed by this idea that we see the body, we smell the body, we touch the body. We're um, addicted to this sense of, of what the body is, which has constructed our perception of what gender are. Um, what, what, what if in the future, um, there's no such thing as, as the body? Every, I've read this book, um, Homo Deus, that says that um, in the future, um, we all might be, um, some of us might be living in games, for example, where our body does not matter in, in, in that virtual reality and our identities could be changed. We could be, um, we, couldn't, we don't have to be a human. We could be an, an air or a fluted thing, as you said, or we could be um, an animal, for example. And how would be, and that is a challenge of how would we be perceived and how would we, we perceive others as a newer identities? I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, it's just something to question. Uh, Mayani, do you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, this uh, body is reality, yeah? part of reality, but our uh, life re reality is not just only conscious of this material aspect, right? There's also spiritual aspect or scientific term, there's also energy. Um, but now in this kind of modern system, we are being pushed towards this materialism, you know, materialistic perspective. That's why the body is becoming like, wow, you know, 
becoming like more important and we have forgotten that there is another aspect which is also important in our life, which is the non-materialistic aspect. And with this, uh, my uh, reference to the Linga Yoni uh, or in China, Yin Yang, for example, talking about the balance, yeah? between this is our understanding that we need to see the reality as it is, is there is this physical reality or material reality mm -hmm. and spiritual or energy reality. And mm -hmm. if we want to be happy and not being dragged by problems, we have to be able to balance it. Meaning that we have to be able to develop our awareness about our potential, whether it is positive or negative, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not like what is happening today, we are being dragged into the materialistic side. And look what happened, we destroy our nature. And then we just see body as an object to be exploited, right? This mm -hmm. is terrible. I think we have to start now thinking about how can we change it? And then now with this pandemic, this is so obvious. This is the impact of that kind of perspective, mm. Mm. which is which is destructive. Yes, it's Absolutely. like actually it's like we are doing stupid thing because we are like destroying our own home and killing mm. our own brothers and sisters. Crazy. Okay, I, I find myself often thinking about indigenous practices and how their own bodies are seen as equal to the trees and the flowers and the water and the earth. And as a consequence, the body is not just something like skin, but it is wood, air, water. And there's a, a great need for, I think, the planet to start to really recognize its interdependence in that way. Yeah, because in, in an ancient time, human seeing themselves as part of nature, not mm. as the master like today. Mm. Right. Yeah. So we have a couple more, more questions. Um, another one from Ilvi Fuentes from the Philippines. She's a self-taught artist and she asks, how am I going to introduce my art since most people here cannot appreciate my art style? Wow. You have to work it out. <laughs> Well, I, I can share my experience, you know, when I also introducing my work with the performance, there, there were never before artists in Indonesia, even in Southeast Asia, doing performance. Mm -hmm. And then when I did that, people really thought, oh, this girl is so crazy. She's really, you know, like out of her mind, right? But then I have to insist. And no, this is something serious. And I do it, you know, for a good thing. Yeah, it takes time to, to be accepted and appreciated. You have yeah. to be brave, yeah? Yeah. Does Kavita or Som have any advice? Yes. Yeah, I think just uh, keep going and you need to fight. Um, sorry. <laughs> just, uh, because these days there are more uh, chance for different type of people um, because there is not only one one way of arts or you know one way of expression or, or mm, there are more more choices uh, I think and and you need to find your at least some community who appreciate you first so you can, can feel maybe uh, confidence and and with that you can grow the community or uh, try to introduce that style to crossing community, uh, maybe. I would say keep keep making the work that you believe that it is right with morality. What you believe it's is good for the community. It's good for the change for the better. And and also, when I started, I felt like this this is needed is the sense of don't be scared of rejections, I think. Like 
before I, f I always felt like, okay, maybe my work is not good enough. Maybe no one's going to like my work. But once I crossed through that, I, I, I crossed past that and sort of, you know, putting proposals of, of my work, putting my work to um, different exhibitions, museums, galleries, and for people to see. And then we can have, you know, conversations with curators of, okay, maybe I should look into this more. Maybe I could research that more. And, and I think through those discussions and conversations comes with new ideas for me to keep develop my work to me to be more powerful but if you know like I keep myself just to myself then I wouldn't be able to develop my work I think thank you okay we have another question and I apologize if I'm pronouncing names wrong here Angrani Widhiyasu is asking as today we live more and more through mediated worlds in which we see each other more often through a screen, I think even though the body surely has this material aspect, we are also facing the situation where the body that is not just flesh, it is also perhaps digitized and mediated. So if we're talking about the mediated body, I wonder how do we translate a notion about our soul or our energy in this case? Does anyone want to have a go at answering that? Yeah, I, I think um, this day on Facebook or in many social medias, many people not really sure who they are and they can be in anybody, right? They, but they create their own character and uh, the style or direction of what they interest. Um, so I think each page or each um, um, how to say the 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 creator that someone create themselves in the social media, they probably can translate their their soul or the energy that you mentioned through that. I think it's, it's possible to do it this day. Yami or Kawita? Yes, it is a very very challenging question, isn't it? Because when when we don't meet other people um, and other people don't see us in, in real life, we feel that we, we are wearing this sort of mask that we are more be able to speak as if we're not in our own person. And, and that sort of changing, changing our sense of identity in ways. So it's very challenging to say that, okay, behind be, behind the screen when people can't see me or when I go into online games, for example, um, when I act as another identity. And I do, I feel like I do things that I would normally not do because I am in that character. So it's very challenging. But the thing is, it's about, I think it's about moral. It's about being most true to yourself as much as possible whenever you're in real life or whenever you're not in real life or in other realities. Yanni? Well, I'm sorry, I was disconnect disconnected just now because the oh. internet uh, connection is not really stable, but okay, oh. I try to answer the question. Do you want me to repeat but the question? Yes, please. Okay. So I was asking, we're living more and more in a mediated world in which we see each other more through screens than in person, our materiality, and it's no longer just our flesh that we're digitized. And the question asks, if we're about mediated bodies, what happens to translating notions of the soul or our energy? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, I mean, I actually uh, was already mentioning earlier about the spirit, right? Besides the body. So this is, of course, has to do with the, the understanding that we have soul. And we have also to take care, not only caring only about body, like what is happening today. Most people are just like busy with uh, presenting, representing the body on public you know, on the stage. That's the tendency of today, right? 
and then forgotten about that we actually have um, um actually it's maybe uh very important to get to learn to know about our soul mm -hmm. our spirit and then we can become a real human not fake human like uh Kavita, call it what, something like a robot or something? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to become a robot. <laughs> okay. Yes, indeed. I'm wondering if any of the curators attached to this overall project have questions for the artist at all? Oh, we have uh, one. Do you want to ask directly, Katharina? Uh, it's more or less it's a comment. I think it's really interesting how you use the fetishizing of the body or the objectificizing of it um, to draw on the one hand on the violence and the, vulnerabil uh, the vulnerability of the body and to show how this is part of a system which is of course a capitalist system and I guess my question would go into a direction what other um forms of um i don't know community or collective thinking could you think because the capitalist system is also very much connected to the nation and state system and i think this might be an, a question uh, how can we um go beyond this materialism that the capitalist system and the very uh anthropocentric system uh, uh, offers? So maybe this is my question, sorry. Yeah, I think that uh, answering that question should be all cultural workers really in thinking about what, what can they do to increase the awareness of our impact in this uh, Anthropocene crisis that we're currently facing for sure. Um, yeah, I think I think, you know, besides creating uh, the traditional artwork, we also have to do something concrete, mm. you know, so we what are not just like, yeah, concrete is like we already discussed about the impact of the system, right, on environment, on human relation, right? So the concrete thing is if we do something related to these issues, environment and also human relation, not only among human as well, only uh, among human, but also with other beings, you know, how we taking care of, of other, other beings, animals, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is what, we, what, what is need to be done. If we really want to, you know, change our, you know, behavior, our destructive behavior. It's understanding that we do operate inside an art market, but then outside of that market, or perhaps feeding into that market, we need to better understand ourselves as contributing to a broader landscape of reality that isn't just about object making. Yeah, yeah, because if we just, you know, complaining, and um, expressing it in our limited kind of, you know, uh, space. Mm. I'm so afraid couple... it will not working. Sorry, we've got a couple more questions from the audience, which is great to see that we've got um, messages coming through. So we have Ritu Satar saying, it's amazing to know all of your practices our shared histories and lived experiences will have more interactions as such. My question is, as artists, do you sometimes feel overwhelmed by the reality that you start questioning if there is some other way to produce your art and how do you deal with that challenge? Can I continue? Because I was just starting talking about that. Okay, yeah. sure. So uh, with my art practice, I don't just limit myself to the traditional art expression. For me, art and life is not separated. So then I'm working with the communities. I'm dealing with environmental problems and challenges and also social problems. You know, I've been working with communities, not only in Indonesia, but in various places like Tibet, like Germany, 
and maybe the future will be also doing something in Australia, Canada, and America, working with a group of artists, indigenous group, but anyway, communities, you know. This is uh, one of the example of uh, another uh, art sort of activity within our own, you know, situation or context of today. And then with this uh, environmental um, activities, uh, we are we can do a lot of things. I mean, starting from taking care of water, uh, doing organic farming, and uh, recycling of the uh, garbage, managing uh, the energy itself. Mm -hmm. You know. And this is possible. And actually there are more and more people interested in doing this kind of thing. When they realize, because now the impact of the uh, climate change is happening everywhere. So everybody can, can experience it. And they know if they want to save this, uh, you know, to survive and mm -hmm. save the coming generation, we mm -hmm. have to do something. I mean, the pandemic, the coronavirus is a big sign of it. So your, your way of dealing with the challenge is to connect to community and yeah. to, to raise awareness and to, to speak and, and to act with particular uh, right. results that speak to cause. Does some yeah. of the people have mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we have to do. Like I give you an example. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Tom? I, I'm not sure I know the questions well. Um, it's just basically saying, do you ever start a project and you feel completely overwhelmed once you start really getting involved with the topic and that being overwhelmed produces you with a, a, a moment where you're not sure how to move forward? How do you deal with that challenge? Um, yeah. I, I work, for example, when I work with uh, the river and uh, a lot of projects related to electricity. Um, and at the end, um, uh, people, uh, um, I mean, during some time, uh, people in the world start to go to uh, renewable energies. And I have a questions on that. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's a is based or is not is based or not. So I, I have sometimes if I don't really know and sure about that, so I stop. But during I stop, I also went to different places to research and understand the topic. Um, but if I'm not really into it or uh, or not really. Um, um, agree with it totally. I I won't uh, continue to do that topic. So that, that's why after some projects, like four or five projects about that issue, I stopped to do this topic because I'm unsure about that. Uh, to go further to the green energy, um, the comment to that. Um, so. But for me, I, as an artist, I don't need to follow this, the only one subject or one thing all the time because um, myself interested in, in different type of, different kind of subjects and, um, and, but landscape is my main interest and, but landscape has a lot of dimension to talk about. Um, so I'm, I think I, if I'm not uh, into that, I go to other things with, uh, which I, I always ask myself what I interest the, more, the most and I have enough energy to, to continue to finish the work the most. So I go to that work. So, so that, that's how I deal with it. I don't need to follow the same all the time, the same, uh, you know, 
subject all the time. Uh, I'm not sure that one's question. Kawita, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. Um, well, I agree with with both artists. I feel that you know. I think for me um, to be able to have to find new journeys, new research, and through new research, I have to um, if I have to express those informations. I feel like because art is sort of a visual language of a repetitive protest for me, right? So I feel that these voices should be heard um, in the art world. And I agree with Arimani, I have, it has to be expressed in other worlds outside of the art worlds as well. So I feel that the challenge is when you have this new research, how do you um, expand your medium, your artistic medium, so that those people would be able to be engaged and access the, the artwork itself. Um, for example, I was I, I began with with video um, as, as as my medium, and then and then performative art, and now. I am have because I've during the pandemic I've played so much games. <laughs> so um, now that my work has has crossed from a video art into um, game development into a virtual reality work, then this is a very new medium that I have that I have to be able to understand the medium, but also making that medium. Um, accessible so that people would understand the core meaning of the work rather than just playing with that medium and okay this is a new technological work but the core of the core meaning is gone I that's the challenge that I have to face with yes so I think this will be the last and final question uh, for the night um, which audiences are you thinking about when you do or make your work? Who are you speaking to primarily? Is that a question for, for, for all of you? Of, who am I speaking to in terms of my, I think my purpose for my artwork is for all audience. Um, as I said before, you know, when I heard about um, people being, being shot, being stopped, being muted and silenced, I thought, not only as an artist, but as someone who's a consumer, I feel that I am a part of a broken system, of a broken, corrupted capitalist system that needs to be fixed. And if I'm not responsible by changing my behavior um, of consuming of fast consumption, then, then this is the problem. So I think that my work will speak to the audience about that they are the problem. They are a part of this this structural problem that needs to be changed by starting with with changing the mindsets of their behavior, the mindsets of of spending, which is the core of this current economic system that is not sustainable. Totally agree. Thank you, Kawita. Som or Yanni. Okay. Well. Um... My work uh, that I'm doing is, uh, of course, for me first. <laughs> but then, yeah, basically it's for everyone, for public, you know, for a uh, member of the community that I work with, for my students that uh, I'm teaching. Um, yeah, and now with this uh, new uh, technology, social media, the so-called social media, we can actually, you know, spread it around, right? Unlimitedly. Yeah, I think when we have this kind of um, ideas and thought that, you know, uh, critical, but at the same time also useful for everyone to remind everybody and then especially if it is combined with the real kind of concrete uh, activities, you know? Uh, so this can be also helpful, I guess. I mean, I hope, yeah? So um, I would like to uh, spread this around as wide as possible. 
That's why I'm working with these communities and making the network, you know, um, in many places in this world. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. thank you. Song? Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure what kind of audience, but when I produce the work, I think some group of people, some people interest my work in the way that is about technique, about how, how challenge I work with the technical part and some people interest in the history. Uh, I mean, because, because my work is documentary and, and I myself uh, document it because I know that it's challenge people in the future, how they look back, I mean, 10 years, 20 years, when they look back to this, the, such the landscape that changed. Um, so it's, it's real, I mean, the audience, not necessarily to be just now, but in the future also that when they look back to the, the, the documentary, they can have some, something to think about. Um, so it's, I think the group of audience can be those who enjoy the technical part or subject. Um, so can be both, both way, I think. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, and it's wonderful that this is, I think also being recorded so people can watch it uh, later. We have two other comments. Uh, I'll just share them. Uh, one came from Thuy Yung Wen, uh, Vietnamese in Thailand, saying that she's quite impressed with the project of the river pouring into its bigger form. It seems as if to express a metamorphosis of the body transformation. And is this a provocative hint? I'm not quite sure exactly what that question means, but I'll share it anyway, it was posed. And then um, a Thai artist, uh, Rungsak Anugutmaman from Thailand, he says, uh, from animus to body of the god to real biology explained, very interesting, and thank you. So from me, thank you very much. That was, um, was a lovely way to spend two hours. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so I would like to thank Zoe and Som Gavita and Arimani, you know, for sharing your work, your thoughts, you know, your uh, wonderful kind of insight. Uh, for our exhibition and I, I, I think that um, and I hope that many audience want to see the show you know the, the actual works of the artists in the show and, and including with other pieces you know which almost like 40 artists and if you are in Chiang Mai you know please drop by at my EM and for those who are abroad uh, please stay tuned for our program because we plan to uh, to to tour around your know, exhibitions on, online again. And for the Gerber monthly public program, which we are organizing on the last Thursday of the month. And for this Erata show, we are we gonna provide more public program, both online and on site in Thai as well as in English. And um, so I look forward to see you again next month and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.